you go to hell. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me ask you something. If the rule you followed brought you to this, of what use was the rule? You, you could have the money, Anton. In playing a game, you are working towards a goal. One possible goal you could have is to enact something you find amusing, compelling, or fun. Another common goal is to be efficient or effective, play the fastest or the best you can. It is very possible for these two goals to converge where playing effectively is compelling. However, that is not always the case. Sometimes the most effective or efficient method is the furthest thing from compelling. And I would say that a game's fundamental purpose is to be compelling. When working in service to efficiency or effectiveness, sometimes we can fool ourselves into working directly against what it is that we actually want. This is how playing well can spoil the game. One goal is not another, and there are a myriad of goals. Two common goals that could be named when playing a game might be 1. To have fun or to be compelled, and 2. To play well or be effective. Typically one would not consider a goal like this purely in the abstract. It would more likely be the greater purpose behind a smaller, more tangible goal. Consider the game of archery. A small goal that might be aligned with the purpose of being compelled might be the simple one of shooting a lot of arrows. Suppose the sensation of drawing the bow and releasing to be a simple form of entertainment, a cause and effect which the user has control over and can feel the difference between a good release and a bad one. A small tangible goal in service of being effective might be that the subject practices and studies proper form. The subject might do this and record their accuracy to mark whether or not there is improvement. These separate goals are seemingly congruent with each other, aligned in such a way that both might be done simultaneously. One can shoot arrows, practice form, and accuracy all at the same time. It seems in a traditional physical game, or sport, playing well is often conducive to the player being compelled, if it is not the same thing entirely. It might be viscerally enjoyable to shoot an arrow with speed and accuracy. A sense of accomplishment might be felt realizing one's ability has grown and developed. It is probably compelling for most to be able to operate skillfully in a competition of athleticism and finesse. In these physical games, limitations are your own, and therefore, when you succeed, it has more directly to do with you as an individual, as you are the game piece. In being effective at one of these traditional games, one could get the sense it is because they themselves are effective. This more closely entwines the two concepts, as if one is effective, one might also be compelled. These traditional games are less removed from reality than, say, a computer game. The traditional game is a set of restrictions with an objective on top of the reality in which it already exists. The computer game is further removed, existing in a simulation where the rules are a thoughtful fabrication designed to bring the game order and substance. There is no pre-existing context in which to place the simulated game. It must be built from the ground up. With this distance from reality, it seems the construction of the rules must be greater, as it is required to create each fundamental piece constituting a game world. Think again of archery but this time in a world where you had to decide how physics works. You would surely need to be careful in your design lest the game be unbalanced or unplayable. Imagine physics be enforced on an archery tournament in such a way that the concept of distance became irrelevant. The bow is drawn back and before it is loose, the arrow already is at the destination by way of the warping space around it. In that world, it seems there would be little point for a sport such as this. 
If there is a gap in the rules to be exploited, then it is only up to chance whether or not the exploitation of that rule will be at all compelling, whether or not that action will feel like a game. Ergo, the most effective thing isn't necessarily fun. However, sometimes we are still obliged to do it out of need or ignorance. In a simulation, in this case a video game, a designer will go to great lengths to make sure the simulation is somewhat intuitive. As stated, the simulation lacks the advantage an ordinary game has of existing in the pre-understood world. So the designer tailors things to the perceived sensibilities of the user. In this simulated game world, all of the things that we inherently understand as a result of living do not necessarily apply but the creator attempts to design around how a human thinks, so it might be easily comprehensible. In most games, when a user jumps, instead of flying away, they fall back down. The simulation lacks gravity, but it is built around its concept all the same, as both the user and the designer are more easily able to comprehend a world with gravity rather than without. This must mean that if there are times when the designer succeeds to make the simulation more comprehensible and intuitive, there must also be times when the designer fails. One way that a game can be comprehensible or intuitive is having its goals of being compelled and being effective to be aligned with each other. When these two goals are not aligned, it creates an unintuitive nature where being effective is not necessarily compelling, so it doesn't reward you for doing anything well. Many design choices follow the quote, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. Take the element of randomness, or as many players call it, RNG. A video game could have everything randomized or nothing. In a world where everything is randomized, the most effective thing might then be to reset the game repeatedly, until you can find the objective immediately, or something to make doing so trivial. It is easy to see how this might misalign the goals of being effective versus being compelled. Increasing randomness generally makes the game less competitive, and if too much is added then it will erode the relationship between compelling and effective. Why then is RNG such a common element in video games? Simply put, it can be very fun if done right. With no element of randomness, the game is the same each time. It is more predictable. There is no small chance to find something valuable or to have something amazing line up. Randomness may push the game further from being competitive or misalign the stated two goals, but RNG can create compelling moments out of thin air that are impossible without it. Randomness is only one element for a designer to choose from and yet it can completely reshape the experience. It can align or misalign goals if the numbers are off just a little. In essence, a simulated game world is designed derivative of reality, and designs are as flawed as designers. Designs in which acting according to effectiveness is incongruent with what is compelling can still be compelling but require a different approach. In these cases, the goals have been split apart and have become divergent, such that acting towards one brings you no closer to the other. This is what leads players to repeatedly spoil their own fun. They mistake being effective for being compelled, when in these simulations, and in real life at times, that might not be the case. Of course, these things are subjective. Each circumstance can interact differently depending on the individual, on their mentality. According to some's biases, the idea of being good or effective might always in their mind line up with that thing being compelling. We might call this a competitive person. But what is this bias? I see two obvious possible mentalities around being competitive. One, it is possible for someone to simply become enamored with the process, the process that aligns with being good at or competing. This person is not necessarily competitive by definition, it just so happens that the person can typically perform at a competitive level due to their love of that process. Two, it is possible that the person seeks being good in order that they perceive themselves as such 
and especially so that others will perceive them this way as well. Obviously, there are more possibilities than this, and likely these motivations would be melded together in some way. Regardless, that means that some people are playing for their own approval and or the approval of others. Playing to be perceived as good at something is in some sense playing in service to ego. I would argue someone such as this being compelled has nothing to do with what they are good at. Someone with this as their primary motivation cares that they perceive themselves as good and that others reaffirm that feeling. This mentality performs for the approval of others so that those others may be a postulate for their own self-worth. If I become the world's best juggler only for my father's approval, I don't think juggling has anything to do with whether or not I am compelled. All this being said, the problem of misaligned goals is as much about someone's mentality as it is about the medium through which that mentality is applied. So you need a game, or a medium, with rules that allow for effectiveness to align with being compelled, but you also require the correct mentality in order to have those things lined up. If these things line up, then maybe it's possible to fall in love with the process. Not everything is a competition. It is also possible for people to chase the goal of fun or whatever seems compelling to them regardless of effectiveness. It is another mentality to be a damn casual. In truth, the casuals who are having fun on their terms are often the most wise. If I only want to shoot people's legs in Tarkov, it doesn't matter if it's good or not if I find it fun. Most players are probably some mutable combination of competitive and casual, or in other words, a combination of being in service to performing well and in service to being compelled. I know personally my mentality is somewhere between being effective and doing what I want. I want what I'm doing to work well, but it is also important to me that I find that thing interesting. If I find something boring or uninteresting in a game, I will almost never do it, even if that thing is the most effective. I won't do it unless it is in service to me getting something I do find interesting. This has caused me to quit many games, but I find myself on the other side of the fence from the people who will grind a strategy in a game that they don't like, think is stupid or tedious. They often do this because they assume that being good or winning is everything and that their time and service toiling to that goal will be worth it. Unfortunately, the only way to know this is to look back on the time you've spent and make that judgment yourself. It's like in a video game where like the most efficient way of farming is by like doing something extremely fucking boring, but like doing it a thousand times and everybody's doing that. And then the developers thinking, oh my god, people must really love this content. Earlier I mentioned different mentalities behind being competitive. What that really refers to in that case is acting according to effectiveness. There is another related mentality that I think is common enough for it to be relevant. The mentality of what I call drudgery, or thinking in terms of a means to an end. In this way of thinking, one considers their work, the means, will produce an outcome, an end. This is distinct and opposite from falling in love with the process, in that the subject either dislikes or is careless about the process. The subject only toils for the end result, for some reward to come. This mentality is also distinct from the one performing in service of ego, as one operating within drudgery is under no illusion of what matters to them or what they value. The subject of the drudgery values the result and nothing else. It is possible for this mentality to be in service of effectiveness, however, it can as well result in the opposite. If the subject perceives no difference in reward relative to the quality of performance, then it is likely that performance will not be an attempt to be as effective as possible. In this case, it is a similar mentality to someone working a dead-end job that they put in the bare minimum effort for. Alternatively, there could be a system or a game where one is rewarded proportional to the effectiveness of the subject's efforts. In this case, it is likely one could be operating in service to effectiveness, even when the subject detests the labor. 
Many people exist within this paradigm. It is the thought process behind working at a gas station to provide for one's family. Ironically, it can also be seen in someone playing a game for leisure. This motive is again the result of the compelling and the effective goals being split apart, but in this case the subject is aware and toils on anyways. The mentality of drudgery is unique though, because its reward structure can mean that the subject is both not compelled in the current process and effective, all in service to some other thing that is valuable to them and probably compelling. In a way, it is a beautiful irony that one might toil for a monetary reward such that they can afford leisure time, wherein they play a simulated game in which they toil for some reward for some other purpose and so on. This and the other mentalities are archetypes of thought that describe a person's motive when interacting with anything really, but particularly with a game. In considering why one might spoil their own fun, the medium through which that fun would occur, the game, must be considered. But one must also consider the user's archetypical thinking or mentality and how it interacts with the systems of the medium, that game. It is not as simple as this mentality provides that effect with this system. All of these things are mutable in time, slippery, opaque interactions that change with our mood, our intuitions, or even we might just be grumpy, hungry, or too focused on the jiggle physics. With these and a myriad more mentalities possible, maybe the subjective goal was jiggle physics all along. A recent famous example of people supposedly spoiling their own fun was Elden Ring. There were droves of Dark Souls enthusiasts descending upon the casual masses wielding something terrible, their opinions. A chaotic mixture of opinions was created where only one thing was sure. Apparently everyone was playing the game wrong. To some degree, I think they, the naysaying enthusiasts, were correct. But they were correct in a meddling, annoying way, likely attempting to condescend the newer users at the gate. Then the classic counter-argument came, there is no wrong way to play a game. Also correct in an annoying way, yes, in some abstract sense, but surely there are ways to play that the subject would find more compelling. The truth that the enthusiasts were yearning to was that if you essentially cheat the game by looking things up, etc., it is possible that one would go through collecting like a grocery list things others discovered naturally. In collecting all of the overpowered items and assembling the build someone else made, one would make the game multitudes easier. This happening on the first playthrough would remove any chance that the user could experience this art piece of a game with fresh eyes, untainted by what is most effective. I would argue being effective is not the purpose of Souls games, it is a side project. And when you become effective only through the thinking and discoveries of other people, in a sense they have played part of the game for you, part of the game that you can never get back, its novelty. However, for some, help was needed, Elden Ring is a hard game, some would simply get too frustrated and quit before they finished it. Each person has a different tolerance to failure. I personally would have suggested then, go until you feel you can do nothing but quit. Then, if you are sure you would quit, seek outside resources. Because those outside resources come with a hidden cost. Each thing you look up in Elden Ring is like a stone overturned for you by someone else. It deprives you of the possibility to ever discover that thing on your own. These discoveries often make Elden Ring easier, a game that arguably is about struggle and discovery. If a user plays with the online map open showing all items, quests, and events, and then the user looks up the path of least resistance to follow, that is solving the problems of the game for you. But the purpose of the game is largely in how you solve those problems. Continue to struggle onto eternity. 
Imagine you were to participate in an easter egg hunt in which the hunters ride bicycles. One participant pays a man to ride the bike for him, and then he pays off the event holders to tell him where all the eggs are hidden. Then he directs the man to where to collect all of the eggs. Would we say this person really participated? All of this makes it sound as if Dark Souls or Elden Ring are not games where effectiveness lines up with being compelled. In my opinion, it does, but only when effectiveness is derived from your own discovery, thoughts, or skill. Those sensibilities are to my taste, and someone with a different mentality might find my method terrible or the game altogether unenjoyable regardless. Though surely there were people who played Elden Ring who think as I do now, and failed to resist the temptation and looked everything up in the first playthrough. I think one such as this would be a perfect example of someone who spoiled their own fun. Possibly, they would have encountered a temporary difficulty spike, then began by just looking up how to get a strong weapon, but the weapon goes along with this build, and a guide on where exactly to go in each area. Before long, the game that was meant to be a beautiful and brutal exploration is turned to a trivial traipse to assured victory the user's freedom constrained and driven on rails of their own volition. Kenshi is a true sandbox game, where you can decide to do so many different things. There is no incorrect goal and no direct way to win. This world is truly what you make it. Kenshi is not very fair, or balanced, or competitive. This being the case can make Kenshi a poor experience if played through the lens of being effective. But only sometimes. Characters in Kenshi scale with stats to an incredible degree. Those stats are multiplied against the gear's coefficients, making the endgame characters kind of strong. This is all fine and good, very good. However, if you then ask, what is the main stat I need to attain this strength? Well, it's strength. How do I get strength? One of the best methods to get strength in Kenshi is to carry a lot. Then you carry that lot on 3x speed and leave the game AFK, hoping that nothing kills you, while your little Arnold closely follows a goat for around 26 hours. So, if I wanted to say create the strongest character in Kenshi, and I did this in a way to be effective or efficient, then I might spend the next 24 hours of my life listlessly babysitting a flickering screen, literally not even playing the game, just watching it like an unpaid surveillance team, for the purpose of pixel power. That being said, I've done this many times. <laughs> next, I need toughness. How do we get toughness? In Kenshi, the best way to get toughness is to get beaten unconscious so we need an enemy that won't do anything bad to our corpse after they bash our head in, and we need someone to heal the main character after he goes down. So what is the method then? You create a torture dungeon for yourself, because what doesn't kill you gives you toughness. To do this, I need to create a small city-state, hire a bunch of powerful men to help me capture another powerful man, so I can lock him in a cage with my weak man so that he can become another strong man. Once we create our setup, it is similar to strength but less automated. You have to keep resetting the fight and healing your character. As I have said, I have done this a few times, and typically I enjoy it. I enjoy it because of the absurd levels of shenanigans you can get up to while manufacturing the perfect conditions to make your little guy unstoppable. However, the actual act of playing this out is incredibly tedious. I enjoy the strategizing and the destination, but the actual act isn't really playing the game at all. What it really is is getting around playing the game. In essence, you are circumventing this portion, a main portion, of the game. I happen to like it in some ways, but again, this is only by chance. It very well could be there is a way in other games to painlessly skip everything. So in Kenshi, if I endeavor to create the strongest warrior, and I do that as fast as I can, the game has changed. This game is no longer Kenshi as it was intended. It is, how can I exploit Kenshi into getting what I want? 
The act of watching the screen for hours on end without playing is not compelling. Contriving a way best to do that can be. Also, the end goal of this process is enjoyable, but imagine for a moment that grinding up your stats was the main purpose of the game, its goal. When you reach level 100 in any stat, you could simply get a cutscene and win. Well, this game would suck. I ask this because I think this is the paradigm some players exist within. They toil in pursuit of being good, efficient, or effective, but that is all they are doing, toiling. When the action is not compelling, and the goal is only in the vague service to being good at, then there is nothing but tedium. In their mind though, because tedium has been made equal to progress, it slips in perniciously, infecting decision making in a way often directly against what it is that individual might want. In some sense, we have been mind controlled by our own vision of greatness. In service to what we yearn for, we sacrifice the now. A common sentiment, but always a gamble. The way I have played Kenshi aligns with one of these stated mentalities, the drudgery. I seek a goal I want and I find interesting, being the strongest. And in order to achieve that goal, I toil away in boring monotony. In this instance, I am able to be compelled only by the future promise of what will compel me. So even within a process I loathe, I can be at play. This example is in some ways an opposite to a fabled warning by a somewhat prolific philosopher. In Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Friedrich Nietzsche writes on how if comfort is set as the primary motivation, it quickly becomes a hindrance and is directly opposed to human flourishing. He calls this idea the last man. Even nested within my own act of comfort and leisure of playing a video game, if it was that I sought comfort over everything else, I would never become the strongest. I would find that which compels me in the first place, in the immediate. As if when climbing a ladder, I stopped and remarked that I was content on the first rung. If comfort is the only purpose, it will feel as a slow, gentle slide into horrible mediocrity. I will have become the last man. I show you the last man. What is love? What is creation? What is longing? What is a star? So asks the last man and blinks. The earth has become small, and on it hops the last man, who makes everything small. His species is ineradicable as the flea. The last man lives the longest. We have discovered happiness, say the last men, and they blink. They have left the regions where it is hard to live, for they need warmth. One still loves one's neighbor and rubs against him, for one needs warmth. Turning ill and being distrustful, they consider sinful. They walk warily. He is a fool who still stumbles over stones or men. A little poison now and then that makes for pleasant dreams, and much poison at the end for a pleasant death. One still works, for work is a pastime, but one is careful lest the pastime should hurt one. The previously stated goals of being compelled and being effective are situationally a mirror to this last man effect. When these goals are decoupled, you cannot seek only being effective, as its excess focus is unbalanced, bringing you no closer to being compelled, and so spoils the game. If you seek only being compelled in the immediate, then you cannot overcome any difficult hurdles as to get to a greater goal. Unbalance breeds problems. So you cannot seek only comfort, then all you would know is rest. And you cannot seek only challenge, then you would never know rest. But if that is the case, what are we supposed to do? You must find your own discretion. You have to understand when something is not worth your time. And when something is, seek strength. Find that which is battering you down into pitiable submission, 
Seek it out and meet it with a fiery passion to overcome that challenge. Don't allow that challenge to define your character into a quiet, gentle weakness where you comfortably rest in the bed of your own failures. Struggle and resist. That is the only way to find a peace from the slow, soothing rot of apathy. Then rest in the bed of your own victories. Know thyself, lest you take advantage of the self. I should probably edit this. Nah, I think I'll take a nap.